Good morning. This is the week of Trinity Sunday, and well, you know, that's the day that we always use the Athanasian Creed. Yes, the long, long creed. One of the things that we often forget along along our, our you know busy Christian lives nowadays, the way in which culture kind of gets us distracted on all kinds of things, is that within the early church, the whole question of who Jesus is, as well as you know God's identity as as being a triune God, was was actually central to the spirituality, not just the theology, but the spirituality of the early church. So that as we as we look at how, what what Christian faith was about, it's reconnecting back to the very source of our own existence, namely God himself, from whom and through whom all things are made, that that we get this this um this you know sense within the early church of of why Jesus is so important. It's because through him, second person of the Holy Trinity, dipping into our own human flesh and joining himself with that for all eternity, that we have access to not only Jesus um, in the flesh and in, in through his body and blood, but then also sacramentally we're connected with him so that we're joined back into the very unseeable and uncreated nature of God. Um, through the flesh of Jesus Christ, and and that becomes that mind-boggling thing, which I know that evangelicalism doesn't doesn't like to grapple with, because evangelicalism has basically turned everything into your decision and what you got to do in order to be on God's good side, you know, variations on that, so that you feel good about yourself. You know, there's that variation too, or that you chase your blessings and all of these sorts of things, rather than reconnecting to the very source, the the mother load of all sources, namely God Himself. Um, through the flesh, the body and blood of Jesus, which is why the sacraments right from the beginning have always been that, that, that great um, source of strength and that, that, that important regenerative element within Christianity. Well, today as we dig into our Old Testament reading, Isaiah 6, we hear the same song that we love so much, holy, 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 um, but we hear that angel song as Isaiah got to hear it. We hear the same song that John got to hear it as he got to glimpse into eternity, you know, as Jesus opens that door to heaven and says, let me show you what's, what's going on in eternity. And, and the, the reflection of it being used there um, does suggest the way in which the early church, and then we know that the early liturgies did use some of these hymns and songs, um, that, that it was used already by the time of the writing of the book of Revelation as um, part of the communion liturgy as we gather around Christ the Lamb who comes and feeds us with his own very own body and blood. That we are not only communing in a way of remembering with the bread and the wine, but instead we're communing, participating, the way Paul says, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, real time, both time bound here, but also connected to eternity. And as we listen to this reading from Isaiah chapter 6, it's this beautiful, beautiful Old Testament reflection of that same thing that we celebrate, and Christians have always celebrated, as we come forward to receive that burning coal from the very altar of God, the Almighty, and namely the body and blood of Jesus to take away our sins. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that in Christ you have not only opened the door to heaven, but that you have provided the way in and through his very humanity, which as we celebrate this, this Trinity Sunday this week, help us to grapple with the the, the beautiful depth that you provide for us there so that as we continue to build upon him that we that we chase after him and that open door that he provides for us in his body and blood all this we pray for in the name of Jesus your son that that savior and that name in whom and through whom we have have salvation all together with the father and the holy spirit in his name we pray amen all right so, Isaiah 6, I love this passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Here, um, you know, back then they didn't have dates counted in the same way that we do now. Um, it's kind of a um, post and then Christian in invention that we count the dates relation in relationship to the time where Christ was born and the and before Christ BC AD and BC or now more common where people want to avoid having to deal with Jesus so they'll say common era and before common era uh, still has to do with Jesus Old Testament they tended to give dates based on key events significant events and in this case you know it's when King Uzziah died. 
um, as we hear this, you know, it becomes one of those interesting Old Testament um, details. Sometimes it's you know, three years after the, the after the great earthquake, or you know, these kinds of things. Well, in this time, basically, Isaiah identifies it's the year King Uzziah, Uzziah died, and he's given this vision where he gets to see the Lord God Almighty Yahweh sitting upon His throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe, basically this royal robe filling the temple. So so not merely, not merely just seeing the Lord, but seeing him in his splendor where, where you know, the gown that wraps around him fills the entire temple area. And notice he doesn't refer to it as a, a throne room in the typical sense of a king, you know, sits in the throne room, but is in the temple. Heaven and the place where God dwells is a temple of which the earthly temple in Jerusalem was intended to be an earthly replica um, to show what was being done here, you know, so that, you know, the, the, the offerings and the sacrifices given there were basically um, to be a reflection of what is being done in heaven. But as we get into this, you know, Isaiah gets lifted up to the real Holy of Holies, the same stuff that the writer of the book of Hebrews writes about when he says in chapter 10 that it is through the, the body and the blood of Jesus, the flesh and the blood, that we have access to the real Holy of Holies, the heavenly Holy of Holies, the same place that Isaiah, Isaiah gets to see here. Those words are just remarkable, the way that the writer of the book of Hebrews uses it. But as we hear this, it says, verse 2, Above him stood the seraphim, so these angelic beings. Each had six wings, with two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew, and one called to another and said, and this is where we get that hymn and that text, which is echoed in the book of Revelation as John gets to look into heaven. It's the same eternal scene, same eternal song, same song that we sing from eternity with those in eternity each time we gather around Christ as we prepare to receive him in the Holy Supper of our Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, who is the Lord of hosts, the God who is seated on his throne, Yahweh of hosts. This is Jesus. Jesus is Lord, the way that Paul writes. You know, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to confess that. Jesus is Yahweh. And, and so this is this full incarnational kind of a theology. And the whole earth is full of his glory. So God's glory is resonates throughout all of creation. Now here, as we listen to this, Isaiah gets to stand there before the Lord Almighty. But the problem is, every Jewish boy knows, okay, um, coming from the Old Testament, standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, no one can see the face of God and live. Because, well, we are mortals, we are sinful human beings, we um, struggle with the brokenness of what sin represents, and to stand in the presence of Almighty God, we have this problem that we face God's judgment. And so here, as Isaiah realizes, he's standing before the Almighty, and not just the way Moses did on top of Mount Sinai, where the Lord walked by and put him into this cleft in the rock, which is where we get rock of ages, cleft for me, that whole song. And he puts his hand over Moses as he walks by to shield him from seeing that glory. Here, as we listen and as we go into this and dig into this text, Isaiah sits there and he says, you know, he's absolutely dazzled with what he's seeing. And so as we go on, verse 4, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. So incense, the voice of the Lord resounds. Here God Almighty is sitting in the in middle of this temple. And I said, he realizes, I'm in the presence of God. I'm standing before him face to face. He said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You realize no one can see the face of God and live. Here is where we move along, though, and this becomes this interesting element, because as we listen, you know, he recognizes and he stands before God and he is crushed in the weight of his brokenness. This is that repentance, that humility, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom where we stand before God and we realize we can't boast about ourselves. We can't just say, look at how great I am. We have to, you know, prostrate ourselves because we stand before the Lord Almighty who holds not only perfect love, but also perfect justice and judgment. This is what Isaiah does. But rather than being struck dead, 
This is what the Lord does, and this points forward not only to Christ, but to Holy Communion, where, well, as we read on, then one of these seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from tong with tongs from the altar. And this is why, within the history of the Christian teaching, Jesus' own body and blood, Jesus' humanity is often referred to, and Holy Communion is tied into this as well, is referred to as this burning coal using the whole image of iron put into a fire. Why iron put into a fire? Well, the iron glows, right? And it takes on the property of the fire so perfectly so that when, when you have contact with the iron, you have contact with the fire as well. And this becomes an image of Jesus in his incarnation, so that the flesh and the body of Christ, the body and blood of Jesus, so perfectly united with the divinity of Christ, doesn't stop being body and blood, but at the same time it takes on all of the properties of the divinity. This is one of those weird things that, you know, you get into with the theology of who is Jesus and all of these things, which unfortunately, unfortunately, the Reformed tradition and evangelical traditions don't discuss in the same way in which the early church did, or the scriptures do. Uh, Lutherans do, but, you know, they, they develop this idea that, well, the body only, is, you know, uh, comes along with the divinity, but it doesn't share in all the properties, so the, you know, the, the flesh um, of, of Jesus doesn't actually give forgiveness, which is hogwash, because Jesus forgave in and through his humanity and his flesh, in the same way that he healed in and through his humanity and in his flesh, and he died to win our salvation in and through his humanity and in his flesh. So that, you know, as we listen to all of this, it becomes this weird kind of a separation that's rooted more in a philosophical tradition than what's there in biblical teaching. The burning coal right from this Isaiah passage became an image to talk about the divinity of Christ and his humanity so fully imbued with that divinity that it carries both. So that as it touches Isaiah's lips, listen to what happens. And he touched my mouth and said... Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. <sighs> so by touching the lips of this burning coal, body and blood of Jesus, this deified flesh and blood of Jesus, touching it to the lips of Isaiah, that his sins are taken away and atoned for? How can that be? This cuts right against, though, this way in which so many evangelicals simply look at the Lord's Supper as symbolic, as a remembrance, as a thing that, you know, we do in order to remember. And you'll get umpteen preachers that will go into weird contortions of trying to say, well, these things don't actually forgive sins when, you know, well, that's what Isaiah suggests. And that's what Jesus says, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And the way that the writer of the book of Hebrews says, not only is it forgiveness, but through the body and blood of Jesus together with baptism, that sprinkling, sprinkling, he says, on washing of renewal, we have entrance into the holy of holies, into heaven itself, through those things. Okay, um, here, here's all the fun part to attach to that. The biblical teaching points to this, that through that burning coal, that live coal, that living coal, that, that living body and blood of Jesus imbued with the divinity of Christ because of his incarnation, we have not only forgiveness, but we are able to stand in the very presence of God. And that's such a beautiful message. So that as we prepare not only our own lives and as we listen to that and get jarred back into that early Christian spirituality where... You know, one of John the, John the Apostle's disciples, Ignatius of Antioch, refers to the Holy Supper as that medicine of immortality which wards off death to life everlasting. Such a beautiful expression. How can it be a medicine if it's just a symbol? It actually gives. Or the way that Peter writes about not only baptism but then Holy Communion is that pure spiritual milk that, 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 so that we can grow up into salvation. If it's just a symbolic thing, it doesn't actually feed us and nourish us. But it is a, a pure spiritual milk by which we are fed and nourished and that we grow up in that salvation. These are gifts by which... You know, we are tied to Jesus, and Jesus pours his life into ours. That's the ancient teaching of the church, in which our Lutheran churches still hold on to. 
And here in the same way as we get to walk together with Isaiah and as we reflect upon that holy, holy, holy as, the, as not only the book of Revelation but the early church and the church ever since and its liturgy has reflected, we get to stand hidden under the brokenness of our lives, hidden underneath the brokenness of our own humanity, hidden under the, well, you know, Luther loves the expression, the hiddenness of God, where God relates to us in hidden ways, but he says, here I am. In, in and through the Holy Supper of our Lord, where he gives and presents himself to us for the forgiveness of our sins, he says, this is where you participate already in everything that Jesus is and has done for you, so that we stand together in the way that our prayers always say, together with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Isaiah, as he stands in the holy throne room here, is the way in which, you know, the book of Revelation, John gets to peek into heaven with all those thousands upon thousands and that group and that number from every nation, every language, every tribe, standing before the throne and before the Lamb who have been washed and made clean in the blood of Christ. Okay, clothed and washed and then nourished with the blood of Christ. Baptism and communion. Again, <clears throat> in this grand worship scene, we participate even feebly, as we receive that same gift before the altar. This becomes that mind-boggling depth of spirituality that gets lost by pushing it aside within, you know, and, and God love them, um, evangelicals who want to take the Christian life very seriously, and that's a wonderful thing, but take the sacraments just as seriously because this is what Scripture teaches and says. Because it is here that we participate, Paul's words, that we share in that heavenly gift, that we are nourished and plugged into the very source of our life, that our sins are taken away, and that the Lord strengthens us and commissions us to send us out into the world in order to be witnesses to him, which is precisely what happens next in our reading. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here am I. Isaiah says, send me. Communion is more than just a symbolic thing. We need to grapple with that, which is why, you know, within our churches, we just don't commune everybody and anybody who walks forward and who can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, there, there is a very deep gift there in the way that Paul writes that, that also comes with a warning of potential judgment if we come unprepared. And the invitation when we when we say maybe not yet is, is not a matter of no, not ever, not never, but it's no, not yet, so that we make sure that I want to be sure that people commune and receive this burning coal for their benefit rather than their harm. The Lord strengthens us there in order to send us out. This is what we celebrate Sunday by Sunday, every time Holy Communion is offered. And this is why we need to be present. It's not just a matter I don't need to go to church because I can be a Christian on my own. No, we need to be there um, as a part of it because every biblical image talking about the church and talking about this wonderful banquet feast and this strengthening of this wedding feast and being part of this grand celebration means we got to be there. And that's why you are invited in order to renew your faith, in order to come and be part of that growth, and that strength as we meet the Lord face to face, in with and under the bread and the wine as he feeds us and nourishes us and Christ presents himself to us there with his body and blood, all for our forgiveness, for our salvation. Amen. The Lord be with you and keep digging into that, that well, the, the, those nuggets of early Christian spirituality. Who is Jesus? Who is this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And then how he has called us into that fellowship with him through the body and blood of Jesus through the waters of our baptism so that we participate in life itself.